All right, how many recognize that movie? We know Chariots of Fire, one of my all-time favorite movies. Just love everything about that movie. It always makes me want to run in slow motion <laughs> with that music going behind me. But it tells the story, the real-life story, of a man named Eric Little. He was a Scottish runner who ended up winning a gold medal in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And after achieving Olympic fame, uh, Eric Little spent the rest of his life as a missionary in China because he was a follower of Jesus. And his family had served in China, and that's where he spent the rest of his life. During World War II, he was interred eventually in a Japanese prison camp, but continued serving and ministering to his fellow prisoners until he developed an inoperable brain tumor and died in that camp in 1945. The scene which we watched out of the movie portrayed an actual race that took place in 1923 in which Little was pushed off the track, fell, uh, fell uh, into the middle of the, of the track, got up, and not only finished that race, but did win that quarter mile race after being more than 25 yards behind. And we start with that clip, not just because it's an awesome clip, a moving clip, a motivating clip, but I think that's almost exactly what the author of the letter of Hebrews wants us to envision in these verses we look at this evening. We're at the tail end of a series we've been in for now a couple of months called Jesus is Greater Than. And if you're visiting with us tonight and have not been part of this whole series, we've been studying through the New Testament letter to the Hebrews, sort of chapter by chapter. And the reason it's called Jesus is Greater Than is because that's the point the author's trying to make to these early first century Jewish background Christians, that Jesus is greater than anything that's come before, and Jesus is our salvation. And so we looked at chapter 11 last week, which is called the Great Faith Chapter. We learned what faith is and what faith does. And today we move to chapter 12, Hebrews 12. We'll end the whole series next weekend. But today, Hebrews 12, the first couple verses. Let me put these verses on the screen and I'll read them for us. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Four things I think the author wants us to see tonight. The first is simply the word remember. Remember. Uh, a few weeks ago, when the Cubs were still um, alive in the baseball playoffs, one of my boys and I decided to go down to Wrigley Field um, and just to be part of the excitement of, of playoff baseball. Now, we couldn't afford to buy a ticket to the game. It was like way too much money to get inside the, the stadium. So our plan was to uh, just watch, to go and sit, sit outside, stand outside in that park area that they've built outside the field and watch the big giant, giant scene they have, screen they have set up. Has anybody ever done that? Anybody go down there and do that? It's really fun. So we went down there and watched the game outside the stadium on a big screen with all the other poor desperate souls that couldn't get inside the stadium. But what surprised me was how much fun it was because you could see the game happening on a big screen, but you were hearing the crowd noise from inside the stadium in real time. So you'd see a video of a guy hitting the ball, and then you'd hear the roar of the crowd. It was just like being inside the ballpark. Now, most of us have wondered here and there what it would be like to be on the field, to be playing in the game, and to hear the roar of the crowd as something that we had done. I often think of that uh, when I read this verse in Hebrews 12. And when I'm in a crowd like that, I also often think of this verse in Hebrews chapter 12. Did you know that large sports arenas like Wrigley Field are not unique to our modern world? They aren't unique to 21st century North America. Uh, this is a photo of the ruins of an ancient stadium called the Hippodrome uh, in a place called Caesarea Mar Mar Maritima in mod modern-day Israel. My wife and I had a chance to visit there a couple of years ago. The ruins of this ancient city are about 70 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Uh, Caesarea Maritima was one of the great port cities of the ancient Roman Empire. It was right on the Mediterranean Sea. Pontius Pilate had a palace right in this town, just a stone's throw from where this uh, stadium was. Uh, the Apostle Paul was once imprisoned in this town during 
during his lifetime. Uh, King Herod the Great ordered the construction of this massive arena that included the track that was 400 meters long and 50 meters wide, designed for chariot races and foot races, and over 20,000 people could sit in that stadium at one time. And that thing was built uh, in the early first century A.D. Now, I think it's quite likely that the author of the letter to the Hebrews may have actually witnessed a sporting event in that exact stadium or one just like it. Because the author is picturing a great crowd gathered in just such an arena. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. In other words, remember all those who've gone before you in faith. As I was doing the uh, study on these verses, I learned something I didn't know about language. Uh, And every now and then you bump into something like this. The word cloud used here, great cloud of witnesses, uh, is the Greek word nephos. And in that day, it had sort of a double meaning. It meant clouds in the sky, but in the local usage, it was a slang word, almost a slang word used for the very highest seats in a stadium like that. In other words, it'd be like saying, hey, our seats for the game tonight are way up in the clouds. That was the way they actually used that verse. So the author is telling us, the image he's building for us is a stadium packed right up to the top row with full of what he calls witnesses. Now, who are the witnesses? What's he talking about? The word witnesses in the Greek is the word martyrion, from which we get our English word martyr. Remember in chapter 11, he's just taken us through all the heroes of the faith as he looks back in time. He he points out people like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses and Gideon and David, those who had gone before, those who had lived by faith, and even nameless men and women who had suffered greatly and yet continued to trust God with their lives the heroes of the faith. So the author is talking about people who had lived out lives of faith and faithfulness and had finished their race. So if we put it all together, the author wants his readers, reading in the first century, and us today to picture ourselves in a great stadium. It's filled to the very last row in the bleachers, the very top row with witnesses. Those who have gone before us in faith. So I started thinking about who would be the witnesses in, in my stadium? Just me. Of course, there would be the heroes of the faith in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. And then all those who have gone after that in the last 20 centuries. It's a really big stadium, you know. But more personally, I think of people like my youngest brother, John, who finished his race in 1988 at the age of 20. And he's gone on ahead of me now. I think of a guy named Dr. James DeWeird who was preaching in our church the night I heard heard the gospel clearly at age eight and decided to give my heart to Jesus. He's gone on ahead too. I think of many, many faithful men and women in this church who 30 years ago encouraged me and prayed for me as a young pastor, and they've gone on ahead. My stadium is full. What about yours? Who are the people in your great cloud of witnesses? Maybe a faithful parent? Maybe a grandparent, a grandma who prayed for you when you were a baby. Maybe a friend. The author wants us to know we do not run this race of faith alone. We have a great stadium filled with those who've gone before, who set an example for us, who inspire us by their faithfulness, and who are watching and rooting us on. Remember, he says, remember. Then secondly, he says, remove. Remove. The second word is remove. Now, to demonstrate this, I need to have a helper, and I've already chosen someone who I think will do a great job. Charlie, come on up here. Charlie Saul is a friend of mine from church. Everybody give a big hand to Charlie. Come on up here, Charlie. Come right over, stand over here. No, I I, I forgot to put my water bottle over there, so I gotta do it. I gotta grab this one. Charlie's gonna be, gonna demonstrate a, a spiritual truth, but he's gonna do so in a physical way. Charlie's an athlete, right? You play, are you playing basketball right now? Yeah. I picked somebody who could handle the task I'm going to give him. So what I want you to do to demonstrate your overall fitness and athleticism, just go from here to there, get that water bottle, and bring it back to me as fast as you can. Go fast. Isn't that awesome? Big, big, big hand of applause to Charlie. <laughs> now, Charlie, I want to put this backpack on you.
okay? Back backpack is, is heavy, you can tell. Now I'm gonna, I might need help with this. Okay, now hold that, that's 35 pounds, okay? And now, just put your feet inside here. <laughs> One more. Oops, he almost knocked me out. <laughs> Can you get your foot in there? <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, this, this didn't work as easy as I thought it would work. Okay, got it? Yeah. Now, fast as you can, just take it back over there. <laughs> He's not too bad. Big hand of applause for Charlie. Now, one question, Charlie, you have to be honest. If I ask you to, thank you, I'm glad I don't have to get down there and do that again. If I asked you to go to, to go to your next basketball game and play wearing that stuff, could you do it? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> he was almost too athletic for me. <laughs> now the point is this. Carrying a little excess weight around for an athlete is probably pretty good exercise, good training. But if you were going to carry it a short distance, just there and back, you could do it. But if he was going to go out and play basketball or run a race, let's say a 5K, let's say a marathon, that'd be a whole different story. No way. You, you'd want to drop that stuff. You wouldn't want to carry any excess baggage with you if you're trying to run a race. So listen to what he says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Author's thinking about two things here. First, he says, lay aside, renounce, put away, remove every weight. The word weight means mass or burden. So the author's saying we are to remove the weights, the excess baggage of our lives that we're just dragging around with us. Now, this weight may not actually be something that's sinful. It might just be something that people would consider harmless or maybe even a kind of a good thing. But spiritually speaking, it's a weight that's impeding our progress, slowing us down, making it more difficult to run. Back when I was younger and playing ball like Charlie, I sometimes would wear ankle weights uh, to practice basketball. Some of you remember back in those days. Now, now I don't think they're, they, they don't think they're good for you anymore. But I put these weighted things on my ankles because I was hoping they'd make me faster or I could jump higher. If I wore them, I'd get stronger. But if I showed up to play a game in those, my coach would say, Coffee, take off the ankle weights. We need you to be at your best. And that's what the author's saying. A weight is that which is counterproductive to the race of faith we're trying to run, something that inhibits or prevents our spiritual growth. Now, what would be a weight? Just off the top of my head, I'm thinking maybe a, maybe a hobby that threatens to become an obsession, maybe something like fantasy football. Sorry, guys. Maybe something like dancing with the stars. Sorry. Or maybe just a trivial pursuit like Facebook or Instagram or some other form of social media. That's not a bad thing, but it's slowly eating up more and more time and attention, more than it really should. Not a bad thing, but maybe not the best thing. That's a weight. He says, put them down. Put them aside. You're running a race. And then he says, and the sin which clings so closely. Now, sin is a completely different matter to this author. The phrase clings so closely is sometimes tra and translated entangles. So sin doesn't just slow us down. It entangles. It keeps us from running altogether. Now, sin is an uncomfortable word in our culture. It's really not used very often. It's not used hardly at all anymore. But the truth is we see it all around us. Even today, this week in the media, day after day after day, right? We're seeing the sins of public figures presented to us day after day. Only the outrages, everybody's outraged about it, but everybody's outraged about somebody else's sin, right? That's the way our culture works. Nobody is outraged about their own sin. This is what he's talking about. He says, if that is in your life, something that is keeping you from running, something that is entangling your life, get rid of it. Put it down. Remove it. 
So what kind of excess baggage are you carrying with you today? It says remove. Third word he wants us to see, <coughs> excuse me, is the word run. The third word is the word run. So he has remember, and remove, and then run. I once participated years ago in a triathlon, and I did a triathlon once. It was one of those mini ones. It wasn't the big giant Iron Man one. It was a little mini one. Uh, just, just took about two hours to complete. Uh, but my brother and I got this, this idea to do one of these, these, these races where you run, bike, and swim. The one we did was swimming like uh, a mile or a half mile, um, running 6.2 miles and biking, I think, about 20 miles. So it was, it was a mini one, but it was still a challenge. So we decided to sign up, and so we started training. It took like six months to train. He was in Ohio. I was here. So every day. I'd, I, every day I would either run, swim, or bike uh, because I knew what my brother was doing it, and we were going to try to do it together. And I didn't want him to beat me. He didn't want me to beat him. So we were training for this little triathlon. And during those months of training, I discovered I really kind of liked the process of the run and the bike because it came more naturally to me. It made me feel like I was getting in shape. But I hated swimming. I mean, I could swim, but I hated it. So the first time I went out to swim at, at a pool, I could... I, I, I could bike forever. I could run. I, I swam one lap and I was done. Just here and down, I was done. I couldn't swim anymore. I thought I was going to drown. And eventually, I was back and forth. Back. I got to where I could swim 20 to 30 minutes at a time, but I hated every single stroke of swimming. So I did it because I knew my brother was doing it. I didn't want him to beat me in the race. So the day of the race comes, he drives over from Ohio. We go up to Crystal Lake for this mini triathlon. We were excited. We were all prepared. And we had pity on the poor souls that we were going to leave in our dust in this race. And then when we got there, after getting our race numbers on us, we felt like real, real, you know, real athletes. But as we got there, we realized, we're looking around, almost everybody's wearing like a wetsuit. We're like, <laughs> what's with the wetsuits? Pansies, you know. And then we started the race, ran and dove into the water in Crystal Lake, and it was in June, June 9th in Crystal Lake, and the water temperature was 66 degrees. Now, if you know what that's like, it doesn't sound that bad, but when you jump into 66 degrees and you're not prepared, yep, I instantaneously hyperventilated. I couldn't breathe. It was so cold. <laughs> I'm trying to breathe. I can't breathe. I'm trying to swim. When you can't breathe and you're trying to swim, it's not a good combination. So I'm trying to swim, plus it's, they're splashing all around me. I'm swallowing water. And then I was no, totally unprepared for the, ass the assertiveness of these these triathletes, they were just violent. And they would swam right over top of me, kicking me in the head and everything. So within about two minutes, I'm dog paddling. And I'm, I'm just, I was dog paddling, trying to stay alive. That's all I was trying to do, just trying to survive. And, and I, my brother's nowhere to be found. I know where he is. I've been, a whole wave right over top of me. And then a rowboat comes up next to me. A guy in a rowboat wearing a, the, the race hat. And he hollers over and goes, hey, buddy, you had enough? And I realized he was trying to rescue me. <laughs> so I said, no, I'm good. I'm good. I got this. No way I was coming out of that water if my brother was still swimming, right? I was, so I managed to paddle my, my way until I caught my breath, eventually finished that race. But I learned something about preparation and endurance. Look at what he says here. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Let us run with endurance. What's the race? The word translated race is agon, from which we get our word agony. Uh, it's a word that means something that demands great energy and effort. Remember the situation. The Jewish background Christians that this author is writing to were facing intense persecution. Their property is being destroyed. Their loved ones are being thrown into prison. They're afraid. Their race was suffering fear and hardship. The author has already encouraged them in the strongest possible terms. Don't give up. Don't drift away. Hold on tightly to your hope. And now he adds another metaphor. Run, he says. Now we see the image of running in faith, uh, other places in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 9 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. What he's saying is run with purpose in your faith. Stay on course. Stay focused on the finish line. The race is the challenge that life sets before us right now. Your race is what life has set before you right now. For the ancient Hebrew Christians, it was persecution and suffering. 
For us today, it might be the sheer stress of living in a busy world trying to hold everything together. It might be loss, maybe the death of a loved one. I did a funeral just the other night, the death of a loved one. Maybe pain, maybe illness, maybe disease, maybe pain in the relationship, maybe a marriage that's hanging by a thread, maybe a dislocated relationship with a, with a, a, a child, maybe fear or discouragement or loneliness or depression. The point is the race is long. And the race is often hard. And there are days we feel like giving up, like we just can't go anymore. That's why the author says, don't just run. Run with endurance. Endurance is an amazing word in any language. It means the ability to withstand hardship or adversity to sustain a prolonged, stressful effort to sustain a prolonged effort. So where does endurance come from? And what does it mean to have endurance in faith? The fourth word he gives us in this passage is refocus. Refocus. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Verse 2, looking to Jesus or refocusing on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Refocus on Jesus, who is the founder, it says, of our faith. Founder, that word is archegon. It means leader, the captain of, the one who goes first. When I read this passage, I think of a time uh, my brother and I were leading a mission trip in South America and Bolivia, of all places, and we were traveling on a bus, on a long cross-country bus ride over mountains, hills, and the roads were not very good sometimes. We came to a place on that trip where a river had washed out a bridge that the road was supposed to go over. A river, at flood season, the river had just washed it away, and we, we, had, to, we, were, we had to get across this River, we're in a, it's a big giant school bus. How are we going to get across? We don't know how deep the water is. But it's flowing fast. So we stopped there, and my brother and one of our Bolivian friends who was guiding us, our trip, jumped out of the boat, out of the, out of the uh, bus that soon became a boat, but jumped out of the bus, and they walked into this surging river carefully to see how deep it was so the driver could see where the shallowest parts of the river were. And they walked out, and the water came up, 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 and it got to, to about right here. And they walked all the way across with the water that high. And then the bus driver fired it up, said, pick up your stuff off the floor, here we go, and drove right behind those guys, and we got across that river. Jesus is the one who goes first. He's the captain of our salvation. Not only is he the founder, the one who goes first, he's the perfecter, the writer says. Perfecter, that word means the finisher. He's the finisher of our faith. Jesus is greater than because he finished our salvation. He made the final sacrifice. He is the final sacrifice. So why did Jesus do what he did? How did he finish his race? His race was the cross. He endured the cross. How? Look, it says, who for the joy set before him endured The cross at the end of the race is joy, the joy of Christ himself. A man named John Stephen Akwari was a marathon runner from Tanzania who represented his country in the Olympic Games in Mexico City in 1968. About 12 miles into the marathon, and it's a 26-mile race, about 12 miles into the marathon, Akwari fell, badly twisted his knee, Uh, wrenched his kneecap out of place, and injured his shoulder. But even though he could barely walk, he forced himself to continue to limp along the course. Now, fast forward to the end of the marathon. The other runners all continued, um, and the gold medal was won by a guy from Ethiopia called named Mamo Walde, and I think an Olympic record at that time. All the other runners finished. The medal ceremony take place. They give out uh, gold, silver, and bronze, and the spectators were leaving the stadium. An hour and a minute after the winner won that race, over an hour afterward, John Akwari entered the stadium 
bandages on his knees, limping badly, and he kept going around the track all the way until he finished. The last of 57 runners to finish the marathon in 1968. In case you're wondering, there's no medal for 57th place in the Olympic Games. He was asked after the race by reporters why he bothered finishing the race when he had no chance of winning a medal. And this is what he said. He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. Hebrews tells us that faith is like a race. That race is not always easy. It's not always smooth. You may be here tonight and be, feel like you can barely put one foot in front of the other. There are days that feel like that. But remember, the author says, you're surrounded. You're surrounded by this great cloud of spiritual witnesses who've gone before, who set an example, who fell and got up, who fell again and got up again. And we can hear their cheers as they root us on. And Jesus, he says, has already gone ahead and already finished the course and promises his own joy. So run. So run. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for this great picture of faith. We're all running a race. For some, we're sailing along at a good clip. For others, it's a struggle and we're tired. And sometimes we feel like we're running alone. Remind us we are not alone. Help us to get rid of excess burdens and baggage, to lay it before your feet. Lighten our load. Help us fix our eyes on you, the one who goes ahead, and help us to run. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.